quarter went on. What are we talking about? We'll be talking about, I think, Model T's and Model A's. Um, I guess we should start with Derek lead in what, how the T and A came about, and Will can talk about how they've died. <laughs> you, you know we're recording, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I can edit all this out. When we go to start, we'll just wait 10 seconds and start over. Oh, okay. That was just a smart-ass comment from me about what are we talking about. Oh. Oh, okay. I thought, yeah, I wasn't sure if you were in or you read the show notes that I sent out 10 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, say let's go ahead and start at one minute. <laughs> Right along for another exciting episode of No Driving Gloves, where Derek, John, and Will will use over 75 years combined industry knowledge to bring you a bare knuckled view on the collector car hobby. So let's get rolling. Well, we've gathered again for another episode of No Driving Gloves, as the intro just told you. So, what have you been up to, Will and Derek? Uh, I'm actually getting ready to go to Columbus for the uh, Good Guys Hot Rod Nationals here uh, as soon as we finish up here. I think I'm doing the same, but in about 12 hours. I've just been working. That's that's what I do. Nothing fun on my end. Nothing fun but just playing with old cars every day, right? Well, you play with new cars, too, so. Yeah, the oldest car I play with at work is, you know, 1953, so. I sent you an email today. Hemmings had an article about cars manufactured in Kentucky over the years. Yes, it did. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a good article. Um, left out a few I mean, with anything you always kind of have to glance over certain things i mean even, even with our podcast a lot of times we can't get into the the deep nitty-gritty details you yeah know, the, yeah we can but we want to <laughs> keep some of the listeners <laughs> exactly. um yeah you know, yeah they're they're doing yeah you know, it was a good article talked a lot about some of the stuff that's happened in kentucky with transportation there was a company that built model t bodies here too ames they actually had built a car called the thoroughbred prior to building the Model T bodies they built. Um, so there was a little bit of some information that was, was kind of slipped over there. A, a good article overall, and actually ties into an exhibit I'm putting together uh, that's going to open August 28th of this year called Kentucky 225 Years on the Move. We're actually looking at 225 years of transportation in Kentucky, uh, all the way from basically a pair of riding breeches for riding horses up to uh, brand new Corvette covers, everything in between. Oh, that's what I thought when I sent you the article because I know you and I uh, discussed uh, potential Kentucky-made motorcycles. I don't know if that you ever found out anything more than I failed to provide you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's one of those companies like so many early car companies and other early, uh, you know, motorized transportation production facilities where they uh, announced they were going to build something and never did. There seems to be a lot of that in history. You know, they claim over 3,200 automobile manufacturers and over, I think, 5,000 motorcycle manufacturers in history. And a lot of those were just print ads. And um, I can't think of the car from the 70s, but those made-up vehicles just, uh, we'll call them money grabs. Since we're talking early cars, uh, we had thrown around an idea for our emergency podcast a couple couple episodes ago, uh, maybe you and I just talking Model Ts and Model As, and Will kind of got mad and you know said, hey, I've got a couple in the shop right now, and he wanted to be in on this conversation. I think we should go ahead and talk a little bit about Model Ts, Model As, history of the vehicle, which I know you're, we'll start at the beginning and go all the way to Will, and where, where they, and how they exist in uh, 2017. So all the way at the beginning. So do we start with Henry Ford and the quadricycle? Because we kind of have to. As the, the quadricycle is that acceptable? I say the quadricycle is a little four wheel. It's still a four wheel thing. Or no, that's the that's hey. a, 1896 or 1897. The yeah. quadricycle. 1896. Henry Ford's first car, the the quadricycle. Basically, he'd already built the what they called the the kitchen sink engine. And uh, played around with internal combustion and engine design. Of course, he was an uh, employee for the Edison company that was basically providing power in Detroit. 
He worked at one of the essentially substations, worked on steam engines and things, keeping the, keeping the power generation going. He was tinkering around at home with various things on internal combustion, had built the kitchen sink engine, um, and then in 1896 comes out with the, the quadricycle. He had built the, the Kane Pennington designed engine, which was in, I believe it was Scientific American, and that's where he read about it. Made a few modifications to it, including uh, water-cooled jackets on the engine to make it run a little cooler and better. And that's really where Henry gets his start in building automobiles. Uh, from there, we'll be involved with the Detroit Automobile Company, which he eventually pretty much folds. Doesn't go very well for him. Best thing that comes out of that is his first race car, the 1901 Ford Sweepstakes, which gets him some notoriety. Then after that, he kind of moves through uh, another company. That company, after Henry Ford leaves it, would actually be what becomes Cadillac in Detroit. Henry Leland took over after Henry Ford left, was pushed out of the company, and renamed it Cadillac. And that's in 1903 when Henry Ford introduces the Ford Motor Company. His goal is to basically build a car for the masses, which eventually will be the Model T. Not so quick rundown of the beginning. Okay, before you go, one of the uh, photos that I've selected for the Instagram and Facebook pages and uh, Patreon pages will show the quadricycle next to the 10 millionth Model T, so people make it a little bit easier on the Google ser searches everybody runs off to do. Definitely. So, yeah, I mean, he, he goes through a number of, of cars uh, before he gets to the Model T. There's the Model A, the Model B, the Model C, so on and so forth. Um, not producing all the letters of the alphabet, but eventually gets to the NRS series where he's perfecting what he believes is the automobile for the masses. The NRS series is, is very close to the Model T, but what he does on the Model T, that's a couple things that are very important. Number one, the introduction of the removable head from the cylinder block, which makes it a much easier car to work on. Number two, he introduces the vanadium steel process. That helps the chassis be actually lighter weight as well as stronger, uh, more durable, more flexible. And of course, three-point suspension to make the car ride better and be usable not only in the city, but also out in the country where roads are extremely poor. And of course, Model T is introduced in October of 1908 as a 1909 model. That's the beginning of Model T. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, as everyone knows, it, you know, there's over 15 million built, and it becomes the car that put the world on wheels. Um, and Henry Ford is essentially the man who takes, you know, rural agricultural agricultural America and makes it a motorized society because of the model T Ford. He's the one that brought the, brought the farmers to the communities and people could venture more than 15 miles from their homes over the course of their lives and things. Oh yeah, I mean dating cycle, I mean everything changes, everything changes. And while we're on the early model Ts, I want you to touch base on, there's a lot of these misconceptions and legends on the Model T's because it's interesting how it evolves. I mean, the Model T that's introduced in 1908 is not the Model T really that sold in 1927 when production ended. There's different procedures that happen. One of, one of the famous legends is the Model T's available in any color but black. What year did that really start? That that wasn't in the beginning, if I remember correctly. They actually offered colors, then went to all black, and then reintroduced colors before the life cycle of the Model T went away. And that's one of yes. the little yeah. legends. Yeah, and actually, you had the phrase you had the phrase turned a little bit wrong there. It's, you could get a Model T in any color as long as it's black. Uh, I've seen if you were paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to finish up something there? Was there more to that question? Or? There there was, but it's left my mind. I'm getting old. Oh, good. That's why I cut in, so I don't have to answer too many questions. Yes, so 1909, uh, when Henry Ford introduces the Model T, uh, it's actually not that cheap of a car. I mean, it's uh, around $1,000 um, at the time it's introduced. You know, wood body, no front doors, back doors, uh, five-passenger touring car. You know, there's there's other models. There's you know, Roadster. There's the the tour about various car you know models of the Model T that are out uh, body styles. Let's say 
But yeah, initially it's offered in colors, and, and the color typically is specific to the body style. So the touring cars were red. If I recall, the tour abouts in 9 and 10 were gray. Uh, roadsters, I believe, were blue, if I remember correctly. It's been a little while since I've, I've studied this and really made sure I was up on it. So I'm sure someone will let us know if I'm wrong on color schemes. And initially, even with the Model T, the first Model T's come out with a water pump engine. And the water pumps have many, many problems. So eventually they move to a thermosiphon cooling system, which is no water pump. It just operates on thermosiphon principle. The hot water rises and goes into the radiator, cools off, goes to the bottom, starts the cycle over again. They also had what they called the two-pedal, two-lever Model Ts, which were a nightmare to drive, had a number of issues with the planetary uh, transmission setup. And actually becomes what some people uh, refer to as one of the first recalls in automotive history. Uh, Although it's it's not really a recall. It was a technical Um, service bulletin at the time. Technical service bulletin, exactly. Ford basically says if you would like for your two-pedal, two-lever Model T to be a three-pedal Model T, we will convert it for you. And they do convert a number of those vehicles over. Over time, the Model T does change quite a bit, although it stays somewhat the same car. There is some frame design changes, rim and tire changes. The body eventually goes to a a wood structure body with a metal wrap, sheet metal wrap around it, um, instead of just being solid wood bodies. And, you know, a number of changes that, that happen over time. When Henry introduces the assembly line in 1913, that is when they start the changeover to painting the Model T's only black. That's one of the things I was going to say is everybody talks about the Model T and Henry Ford creating the assembly line and they rolled them off and they were all black. And that wasn't in 08. Like you said, that came about in 13. I mean, it was five long years that these were still hand assembled cars. So it's not like you woke up in 1908 and things were one way and the following following year youtube had happened and everything had changed and it was still a little bit of a progression in that time yeah exactly and i love that we just compared the model t to youtube that is awesome Uh, (laughs) (laughs) maybe maybe one of the model t's that will's going to talk about can be related to youtube but i I don't know about the early and the reason they change over to black they, they go to one color just to make it easier on the assembly line of course, if you have different body styles going down an assembly line and you're trying to sort out which one's going to get painted which color, it's going to take more time. If you just shoot everything that's going by black, it's going to save time. They save time by painting all the Model Ts black. And then, interestingly, in Ford, of course, with the Model T, leads the market. Um, you know, He has the highest sales because the Model T is uh, an affordable car. Millions of people start buying it. By the early and mid-1920s, General Motors has come out with their slogan of a car for every purse and purpose, and they're starting to build cheap, affordable automobiles as well as mid-range automobiles, and suddenly General Motors takes the market you know, market lead and shares of, of how much they're selling, and Ford realizes, uh, m- mainly at the pressing of his son, Edsel, that they have to change something. And the first thing they try to do in 1926 is bring colors back to the Model T Ford and uh, make it look like a little more modern automobile. So in 26 and 27, you can again get Ford Model Ts in color. Uh, But then, of course, 1927 is the end of Model T production before they introduced the Model A in 1928. Before we get into the, the Model A, let's go back to a couple of those legends with the paint processes and that that Ford used over the... I guess it's a 20-year model run of the Model T. You know, there's legend that says they were brush-painted or they were spray-painted or they used a procedure that I've always referred to as Japanning, especially on the fenders, where they dip, dip the panel in a barrel of paint, pull it out, hang dry it, and then slice off the, the little dribbles that form. With your experience and knowledge of the Model Ts, I, I just know what I've read. I haven't been, you know, as firsthand as you. Did I just spew a whole bunch of misconceptions and legend or is there truth to that or when did they go to spraying model t's from brushing model t's or did they was japanning actually used i'm I'm not 
100% up on all of the paint procedures that were done to the Model T, but we know that the earliest Model Ts, of course, are paint, uh, brush painted, as, as any other automobile at the time would have been. That was the technology that was about, would have been the technology Ford was using to paint his bodies. And actually, the bodies very early on were being built by another company and being put on the Model Ts. By the time they get the assembly line going and, and a little bit into that process of the assembly line, we actually have pictures. There are pictures from the California assembly plant of the paint department. And they actually had large vats, very interesting, uh, basically pressurized garden hose with about, I think it was like six nozzles um, on a sprayer. And the bodies would, would of course, on the, the hanging assembly line, hang over the vat. They would spray the paint onto them with this, you know, very rudimentary spray gun. Essentially, it would run down until it dried. And there are actually unrestored Model Ts that still exist where the paint at the top of the doors is very thin and at the bottom it's very thick. A lot of people over time have said, oh, it's because, you know, people were riding in it and they wore the paint off top. Well, after more research and and more people looking at those cars, it's come to be known that no, this is from the paint process. It sagged down to the bottom of the car and was thicker at the bottom, stayed thin at the top uh, because of the process of it running down. And then as for the the dipping and Japaning, I, I believe there was some of that done on the fenders for a time. Most of what was dipped were the wheels. The wheels were all dipped, and they had an actual machine that dipped them into a vat of paint, black paint, and then uh, basically brought them up and spun them at a high rate of speed to spin the excess paint. Anybody that's painted a set of wire wheels would love to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> any wheel, any any oh wood spoke God. wheel or wire wheel, oh. it, we need to have the, the that spinning machine back because it's just so much easier. Now, wheel, wheels are very hard to paint. And then we'll t- I'm going to touch on a little of the economics behind the Model T. And as Derek alluded to, by the 20s, Chevrolet was introducing cars that were competitively priced. But in Ford's genius, you know, he's also attributed with creating the 40-hour work week. He's attributed with giving people time off because he created the $5 a day wage so that you know, his PP, he could get employees to help build these cars in, in quantity, but a lot of good it did to pay them th- this huge sum of money for the time, or his employees couldn't go out and spend it. So he created this 40 hour work week. He created the Saturdays off. He allowed his employees to buy his cars. Yes, there's a lot of, let's say, underlying evils of Henry Ford and some of his business practices and his camps and his towns that he created to help produce the Model T in the name of efficiency, we can credit him for for that 40-hour-a-week work week. We can create and credit him for the development of consumerism in the society because he realized that if you paid people a good wage, they needed to have some time off to go spend that money, or otherwise the money never got recirculated. And then, of course, you alluded, uh, Derek, that Etzel uh, Ford was a little bit more cutting edge than his conservative father, pushed him to add colors to the Model T. But for our Chevrolet and other manufacturers were quickly surpassing, really, the 1908 technology of the Model T in styling and that and forced him into the Model A. Oh, yes. Yeah, Etzel was definitely, had it not been for Etzel, Henry would have stuck with the Model T Ford until Ford Motor Company was basically broke and out of business. Well, we got to cover a little bit of the Model A because we'll get into some of that with with Will, but that was just a much more refined car. Uh, It was the kind of the, I want to say the last of the four-cylinder Fords because the uh, Ford V8 was introduced in 32 or 33 when the Model A was replaced. It was only a brief four-year run for the Model A, but it helped keep Ford on the map and proved, I think, a little bit to Henry 
that things had to change and it was, you know he had created a monster of a market that was going to be ever changing and change was inevitable so we went with the you know the model a's and we got into the the newer fords but shortly thereafter world war ii rolls around and everything everything happens the world changes uh, scrap drives caused a lot of Model T's, Model A's, any pre-war cars to be scrapped. We lost a lot of those to the recycling drives so that we could build tanks and uh, B-29 bombers and, you know, survive everything towards the war effort. Obviously, the war interrupted production for five years. Ford was very integral into helping and converting their assembly lines to survive World War II. But then we get through World War II, and there's where kind of Will's industry started, is that all of a sudden people came back from World War II, young, invincible thinking, and a little bit of money. And that's when they started to build these hot rods and street rods, and Model T's and Model A's were abundant. I mean, Henry built 15 million Model T's. You could buy them for five bucks, and then the objective was... We've got to make them go fast. And is that where you see kind of your industry starting, Will? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, that's that's exactly where it started. When they came back from the war. You know, they wanted a, a car that they could go have fun in and, and race their buddies and, you know, go to the dry lakes and see how fast they would go. And, um you know, they started developing parts for the flathead and uh, speed parts and aluminum heads and just all sorts of stuff. And, and that that's the that's the one hundred percent beginning of, of the hot rod era. You know, and it's it's uh, stronger today than it than it's ever been. Definitely, those those guys that started that. If you really want to think about it, Henry Ford created with the Model T in nineteen oh eight. He put America on wheels, and then amazingly, I guess we could we could go out on the limb and say 40 years later, he inadvertently invented the street ride industry, or the hot <laughs> rod industry. <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right. And you know, Fords are the, the number one choice back then, and they're still uh, the number one choice. More 32, 33, 34 Fords. Um, the, the Model A, when I was growing up, was kind of a poor man's hot rod, you know. But over the last couple of years, Model A's hot rods have just took the world by storm again. Well, as uh, we, we've discussed in the past, Derek mentioned, yeah, I could pick up the, I want to say, Snyder's Model A, Model T parts book, and I can order every part I need to do to build a Model T. Uh, we've talked yeah. Brookville Roadsters. They can't keep up with production for building steel Model A bodies for, so yeah. that people like you have a place to start because all the originals are either in the hands of collectors not wanting to modify them uh, or in the hands of street ro- hot rodders that have, have them to modify or have them and I think we've alluded to they, they're even being shown at some, you know, Pebble Beach has had a hot rod mm-hmm. class in the past. I believe that they're not doing it now, but it's bound to come back because it's important. And I think That's when, right. when you and I were in school, a gentleman who lived just north of McPherson, uh, he has a couple extremely collectible period correct uh, street rods or hot rods, if I'm cur- not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a. That's a real popular thing right now and is period correct hot rods and getting period correct speed parts and um, you know, twenty years ago you could buy that stuff for next to nothing. Um, and now, you know, you try to go find a set of grand core heads for your flathead, you know, you're gonna pay out the wazoo for that for that stuff. Um, you, you know, nobody wanted it back in the uh, in the 80s and some of the early 90s is when that started really kind of uh, coming about. But over the last 10 years, it's just really gotten popular, and those parts have gone out of sight. 
but then there's a lot of people reproducing, you know, early hot rod parts as well too. So that's, you know, it's kind of cool that people are doing that and, and keeping it alive. In my opinion, I think it is. I mean, I would love to be able to afford a uh, period correct hot rod where it, you know, rolled out, rolled out of the uh, salt flats in, you know, 1947, 48. And you can go to the West Coast and it's still out there, but all of the all of the good parts on the East Coast are are pretty well uh, pretty well gone. Well, they all went to the I think you know the, the industry started in the West Coast. That's where everything was, and if they're on the East Coast, they're in the hands of people that don't seem to want to let them go. I'm, I'm thinking back a couple years ago on one of the Discovery History Channel shows, they visited a place here in Birmingham, Roscoe and Cheaters. Mm-hmm. And I know where it is, but they yep. don't sell anything out of it. I guess he's still letting the parts appreciate. It's like, I guess we go to the Gold Rush guys. If you could ever get into that area, it, it's a, literally a gold mine of authentic NOS speed parts. Tried my best to, to at least get in the doors to have a, <laughs> have a smell. <laughs> but, yeah, that's right. You know, honest, honest Charlie's in Chattanooga was was one of the biggest, you know, shops around too. I mean, they, uh, I think a lot of their, you know, original inventory stuff is, is uh, of course, owned by Corky Coker now. But a lot of it's just decoration and uh, will, will never be uh, used for anything. But uh, you know, at least it still exists and people can go see it. And I guess that's where we bring. You and Derek to your uh, to a head match here because you're talking. You know, you're talking. It's good that at least the stuff's around and being preserved and displayed, so we can be exposed to it. And Derek and the conservator, I'm sure, is there. You know, just chomping at the bit, wanting to you know strangle people that build. <laughs> you know, cut up these per- perfect Model A's and Model T's. I recently read an article. I believe it was Hemmings posted it. And uh, Barry from Storage Wars owns Scrape, which is a Lincoln Zephyr from like 1940, 41 Lincoln. The guy that bought it, bought it as an original car with the agreement that he was not going to turn around and sell it to a a hot rodder or a street rodder. (laughs) The story went on to say, well, he kept his end of the bargain. He's just happened to be that street rodder that cut up the car and destroyed it. You know, again, I think I've said that as long as it's not the last one, maybe it's okay because it's a different look. And Scrape's coming to market here in the next couple of months, I believe. Uh, I can't think of Barry's last name, but he's putting it back on the market and is trying to sell it. He's cleaned it up, returned it to the original colors and a lot of the original styling with some um, updates. But... Um, modifying some of these cars, or should since we have the ability to pick up a catalog and order a new frame and a new body and a frame that's actually built to handle an LS power plant or a five liter Coyote motor, or you know if you wanted to go crazy and put a you know a diesel in these things, and so is that what people like Will should look like look at, or is it okay to sacrifice another one or two or hundred? <laughs> no, I mean I'm uh, I'm kind of like I think I'm kind of like you, John. Model T's, Model A's, things that were mass produced. You know, there's millions of them out there. Or there were millions of them out there. There's now you know a couple hundred thousand out there. If you're gonna hot rod something, I'd rather see one of those get hot rodded. Say you know a Marmon or a Duesenberg or one of the the more oddball low production cars um, that are out there it's 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 hard to see one of those get hot rodded but you know it, it's understandable they also had a different look they, you know you you wind up with a hot rod that doesn't look like every other model t hot rod or model a hot rod that's at the local cruise in or the car show on the weekend as long as you're not cutting up the last one if you're not you know destroying a really great Let's say unrestored original car. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna chew somebody out or, or get mad at somebody for doing something they want to do and 
enjoying the car hobby like all of us do and kind of have the car they want to have. I was saying, I'm sitting here thinking, and you, you drop, you know, hot rodding a Duesenberg, and you hot, hot rod, and we're talking about Fords, and I'm thinking of the irony that uh, a couple of years ago, there was a car called the Duesenberg, and that, that was built by a guy just down the street from Will. Um, and it took a lot of, I want to say, Duesenberg styling cues and put it onto a, uh, was it a Ford Model A? Maybe you know Will? or Actually, it started life as a, uh, I think it started life as a sedan, and then they made a B four hundred out of it. Is what they did. Yeah, it was actually built by the guy that gave me my first job in the hot rod industry. Is a, uh, I know we were talking about Zephyrs a minute ago. Another just a little quick kind of off subject story. We were we were hanging out in front of Templeton Hall in McPherson when I was in college, and I was working for Allen during the uh, during the summer months. And there was some guys come be bopping in, and they were talking about donating some cars. And, uh, you know, me being the hot rodder that I am, he showed us a couple of pictures of a, a 37 Zephyr. And he's like, y'all know what this is? I'm like, it's a 37 Zephyr. He kind of looked at me funny. I'm only 18 years old. And he said, how do you know what that is? I said, well, the, the hot rod shop I work at, there's one in there we're cutting the top off of and making a 37 three window. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that guy, oh, he he just turned around and walked away. Now, granted, the car that we cut the top off of, that was the only decent part left on the entire car, you know. But it was kind of funny to see his reaction uh, when he thought we were cutting the roof off of a perfectly good Lincoln Zephyr. <laughs> and that's what I was alluding to with Eric, is that there are the diehards out there, and we don't, you know, we don't want to offend him, but we each we each have our thinking in, in in this hobby. And if you're having fun in the hobby, that that's it. There's a lot of history to it. We've got to you know choose and choose wisely on what to do with what's left to us. And like Will said, it's the only part left. There's not much. Uh, we talked uh, with with. And I can't remember which car you said that you lost to the tree, Derek. But it can, you know, it, it can serve to breathe life into other vehicles. And that's that's a question I get get a lot: is what what should I do with it? It's not feasible to restore. It's not feasible to bring back to life. Should I scrap it? Should I crush it? And that's the sad thing about all the junkyards out there that seem to show up every couple of months on. Bring a trail or a, a, um, a bar, excuse me, barn finds. These all, all these junkyards are going away because ur urban sprawl has taken over the areas, We're losing the grounds that they quote are polluting. Um, they would just go in and shred these cars, and well, they're all rusted out hulks, and there's nothing worth anything on them. But there's you know stainless trim, there's glass, there's it's not economically feasible for me or you or anybody to really go out and try to salvage the, the usable stuff because you've got to have you've got to be able to turn it you can't turn it immediately but if you know if all of a sudden i'm restoring 62 chrysler newport uh you know not everybody's there's not one of those under restoration every day but if i am and i need a bumper or i need a piece of stainless I need to go to that junkyard in Oklahoma or Nebraska that has these and get it. And that's where these people are making their living. When we go in and we go, oh, I need to build a shopping mall or I need to build a new apartment complex. I guess that's the big thing is condos and apartment complexes and subdivisions now, as opposed to revitalizing our downtowns. We'll let those crumble and decay, but we'll take away our junkyards and all our good parts that are left out there to help preserve the cars that need an organ donated to them, as I guess we'll say. That is kind of, a, I think, the, the best way to look at the situation when we have these cars that are half buried in the ground or, um, you know, a tree falls on them. And, and by the way, it was one of our Marmons that that happened to. Um, yeah. It's just like looking at, like, at least the way I'm going to look at it. Yeah, you know, when Will and you guys, you know, we talk about, like, Honest Charlie's. 
um, and, and places like that. And Will said, you know, there, or maybe John said, you know, they're used for decoration. You know, at least people can still see them. And, and I think John knows me well enough. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the diehard guy. My cars are typically going to be restored to the way they came out of factory or, you know, preserved in their original state as I find them and, you know, driven around that way and not modified. Um, I'm, I'm the guy that, you know, when people say, oh, you, you better put juice brakes on that so you have hydraulics so you can stop better, I laugh because as long as you got mechanical brakes adjusted right, you're going to stop. And you just have to know that that's what you're driving and, and you have to be responsible with what you're driving. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty diehard in that fact. The parts that are left around, be it the speed parts or any of these parts in a junkyard um, that maybe we're not going to be able to use again, yeah, necessarily because they're damaged or somebody doesn't want to let them go, they do give us the chance to reproduce what has been made. We could take that part, you know, make a new mold of it, get it cast, machine it, and have that part again, it, especially with the 3D uh, rapid prototyping that we're able to do nowadays with the machines they're coming out with. You know, you could take one of, you know, one of those, you know, hot rod parts, original, uh, you know, Huna Arden head or early root blower or you know, whatever part you can find that you want, but somebody doesn't want you to have it to mess it up and put it on a car. We can easily take that or something out of a junkyard that's, you know, not usable, scan it, print it, cast it, make it, machine it, and put it on a car so we have a period correct part. There's, there's a car out there, that it's a hot rod, but it's almost, it's crazy that you've mentioned that because, and it's a Model A, and it's a hot rod. It actually competed for the Riddler this year, built by a good friend of mine, Andy Leach. And there might be one or two period correct parts on that car, but if there are, I would be surprised. It's all either machine, even the Arden-headed, blown flathead in it. Every bit of that was all recreated. Um to keep the look going and the the headers the the way the underside of the car is designed um it's uh, it's a wicked wicked car and uh, just about every part on that car was either handmade or cnc machine uh, but it was all made to look cast and thinned and like it was you know like it was built in the 40s or, or you know the the you know, late forties, so it's a it's a very cool car. Yeah, and I mean, even that technology today for those of us diehards um, is beneficial. You know, I mean, I've I know guys who have early nineteen aught nineteen teens era cars, and the biggest problem with those is the aluminum that they used cast parts with back then. It's, it's not really great aluminum. Um, it's difficult to weld when it breaks. It typically doesn't like to weld that well. You know, I, I've known a couple guys who have had maybe their you know transmission case, which was cast aluminum, break apart on them. Well, this is you know one of the last of this car, and nobody's going to want to sell me their spare or the one that's in their car that they're driving. So what do you do? And I've known guys that have created complete transmission cases basically making weldments and then machining them and you know working them until they look like a casting um and i mean just recreating a transmission that is much stronger than the original because now it's a weldment with better aluminum alloy but they've done the work to machine it and and actually make it look like it was the original casting that was done in 1908 1909 whenever it was done so the increase in technology that we've had, we, we started this out with the Model T and kind of, you know, the, the very rudimentary technology that the Model T was putting the world on wheels. And now we're talking about all the things we can do with rapid prototyping. <laughs> rapid, uh, rapid prototyping. <laughs> like you said, YouTube would come in because now, now all of a sudden you just can go. There we go. The, the, the most popular search term on YouTube is how do I? So. How do I make a set of Arden heads? And you go to YouTube and you watch somebody do it on their Haas CNC. There you go. But, you know, we Will talked about a car that competes for the Riddler, and you're talking about people recreating these 
you know, engine parts and crankcases and transmission cases new. And it goes to the little saying that it, you can, uh, we used to say in one of the places I was employed, where there's a wallet, there's a way. And it's mm -hmm. that these yeah. things are not the cheapest. Um, excuse me. The, these are not the cheapest things to do, but they can be done. And what's ended up happening is the original components are so expensive. It's actually, even though I guess the comparison is I've recently looked at a engine case for a restoration I've been involved with that to buy the original engine, complete everything, I'm going to spend 40 or 50 grand for it. But if I was to make the crankcases, well, all that I need, because the transmission and the, the crankcase are all one piece, and the one I have doesn't quite fit together, I'm going to have twenty grand into making it. So it's a lot of money either way, but it's making the original part a little bit more valuable. But we're able to put two or three of these machines out in the world again. And what I support is we got to have. We need to have these out for people to enjoy and to see and to appreciate so they stay in the hobby. But that, that original one's always going to be worth a little bit more. But if we want to just, well, we don't want to do that because we want to keep it original. and It has to be original parts and we can't make the stuff. Nobody's ever going to get to enjoy this machinery and it's going to get forgotten to history. And, you know, th this planet's really good that after 20, 30, 50 years of not doing anything with something, it takes it back and consumes it. You know, sure. You know, look at sidewalks that haven't been used in 50 years. You know, Look at all the stuff that the Romans built that is now just all overgrowth and has gone back to the planet. It, you know, Earth will do that to us no matter what we want. And here you are, you know, here I am talking about earth and taking everything back but it's going to take these cars back if we don't work with them and keep keep them alive it's just the nature of of the beast and the planet we're at is it's it's a full circle and we're just trying to keep some of these man-made creations around and keep people's interest in these man-made creations i'd like to go back when you're talking about you know the junkyards and stuff you know that's another big thing about hot rodding and, and street rodding is um, when when I was growing up as a kid, you didn't have you didn't just pick up the phone and order a part. You know, if if you needed uh, to customize your car or, and you wanted to, you know, put something better on it, you went to a junkyard. You know, you walked the aisles and you saw something cool on something a little bit later model and. and you know, you, you adapted it to your car to personalize it or make it better or, you know, whatever you wanted to do. You know, a lot of that is gone because of um, junkyards being gone. And you can just pick up the phone and pretty much order whatever you want, too. So so hot riding had a lot to do with when it was created was, was going to a junkyard and finding a motor out of something that had more power than the one you got or or a piece of trim that was, you know, on a 48 Ford that you wanted to put on something else uh, to make it cool. So that was, that had a lot to do with the upbringing of, of, of hot rodding as well. You say that, and it reminded me 30, you know, 30 years ago when I was a teenager, and I would go to junkyards with reading that in magazines and that legend, I could just wander the, the junkyard and, <laughs> you know, find a part and figure out how to make it adapt. 30 years ago when I was doing it, junkyards were just beginning to change. Mm -hmm. Insurance came in and, oh, no, I needed to tell them the part. And they had to go out and get the part. And yeah. unfortunately, I think maybe that's why some of the, these older junkyards have, have died. And, of course, they don't have great computer inventory systems. There's a really great website I go to for the junkyards that categorize a lot of parts. And I can just go to it, do a Google search or a search on this site, and it'll tell me every salvage yard in this country that has these parts. Being on a late 70s uh, Japanese race car. And I found a couple of these parts, 
And then when I called the junkyard to get these parts, they said, oh, we've got a whole bunch of these cars, but we don't sell enough of them to inventory. So no, nobody can find them in this internet age that we have. So there, it doesn't seem there's a demand. If it's not a, if it's not on eBay, it doesn't exist. And unfortunately, that's not true either. And that mystique of going to the junkyard and, you know, with somebody like Will who's trying to create and figuring out what door handle do I want to use. There's no wandering the aisles for hours figuring out what happened. Uh, I mean, and it, it goes back to even, I want to say, car design, because there's stories that if you worked at Lotus Cars in the 60s, nobody parked close to the building. They tried to park as far away from the front door of the office buildings as they could, or the factory, because Colin Chapman, if he was designing something and he was looking for something, he would wander the parking lot. And if he saw a taillight he liked, or if he saw a door handle he liked, or he saw a wheel design he liked, he'd take it off the car. So when you got <laughs> off work at the end of the day, you went out to your car and you were missing your taillight lens or you were missing a wheel or a door handle or and whether or not it's true or not, you know, so a lot of these stories from car culture are, you know, embellished a little bit. But that's what we need. I think you need that creativity. It's not, you know, there's been many nights, we'll go back to, you know, one of my cars. And, oh, I bought this car. What can I do? And what do I do? eBay search and oh, I can get this sticker package or I can get this chrome trim or this door edge molding that, you know, 30 years ago when I was building mini trucks and uh, CRXs and car stereo stuff, I could go to a junkyard and with a little persuasion be able to walk around and find that missing part. Uh, Derek, do you have different experiences? Because you, you do work with a different era of cars, but I would imagine there's not a lot of salvage yards with your toys in it. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a shame. The, the salvage yards that had the good early stuff are pretty much gone by the wayside. Um, there's, there's not too many left out there. Um, I grew up in Michigan, and there were a couple in Michigan that I went to as a kid. Uh, actually, one had a, a 1974 Pontiac GTO in it. It was probably up to the, uh, the hubs in, in mud, but there were a few salvageable interior parts and engine parts on it that uh, we were able to acquire for the restoration of, of the 74 GTO I had. And then, you know... It, it's it's difficult, and other than that, it's for the early stuff. It's going to the swap meets and and walking the swap meets and and talking to people and just trying to find where the parts are. Um, you know, like, like you say, it's I guess going to the swap meet is now like the good old days of going to the junkyard because even when I was a kid, you know, teenager, late high school, early college, I remember myself and some college buddies making a trip to one of the local junkyards up near Mount Pleasant that had older cars. And actually, I think the oldest car I remember in there was a late 20s Chevy. Um, that was about the only 20s era car in there. A lot of 50s, actually, I'd say 40s, 50s, 60s uh, era cars in it. And, you know, this is in the early 2000s. Uh, and we got the lecture, you know. Ah, you kids, what do you want to do in this junkyard? I don't want you running across the hoods of these cars, and I don't want you doing this and that. I don't know if I should even let you in here. You know, and it was it was four guys that all owned 60s and 70s era muscle cars that were looking for parts. And, you know, it was just the mentality of we're a bunch of kids that just want to mess around and break things. You know, that made it difficult, I think, for our generations to be able to do some of the things that had been done before. There was a a really good junkyard back in western Kansas when uh, John and I was in college together and we rode out there. I don't, did you ever go with us out there, John? No, I remember I remember the discussions, but I, I was in a restoration program, but not with all the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we went out there, I think, three times. And, um, you know, there was some some 30s. I don't know if there were any 20s. I think he might have had those put up in the building. Um, but, you know, a lot of early early cars. And, um, you know, we told him we were from McPherson going through the restoration department. And, um, 
And he was like, go out there and look. Of course, none of us had any money to buy anything, and he knew that. But we were just, you know, out there because it was cool looking at old cars, you know. And uh, you, you look for stuff to do when uh, you go to college in the middle of Kansas. Because there, there is nothing to do. Um, that goes back to me saying we've got to support them. this car hobby. We've got to encourage the kids to do stuff because I'll bet, even if you don't realize it, you've taken some of the design and styling cues that you're using on your cars today from some of those things that you might have seen in that junkyard in Kansas. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. That's, um, you know, when I graduated college, I was into the more uh, what I call swoopy street rods, everything slick, everything smooth. Um, but as I've gotten older, my taste have changed drastically where I'm more into, you know, the more period correct traditional type, type cars. So yeah, that, that stuff that, you know, walking up to, you know, certain cars back then and remembering little pieces of this and that. Yeah, that, that, I do. I, I, I think about that a lot. One of the things we wanted to touch on in this, and one of the reasons Derek and I didn't try to do a 45-minute lecture on Model T and Model A development, was that you are presently, if you can talk about them, I know some of your projects are a little bit secret, working on a couple of these T's and A's in converting them into hot rods. Well, actually, believe it or not, we've actually just finished a restoration of a 29 roadster um no this this one is uh this one is a legit restoration it's not uh you know it's not going to go to a model a show and 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 win best of show because there there are a couple of little minor you know changes here and there but it does have the uh you know original chassis it has the original wheels motor transmission um we did change up the interior just a little bit because the guy that owns it is 6'5", I believe. Um, so he lowered the seat down a little bit so he could actually drive it and enjoy it. And Really, really cool backstory on the car is, is one of the biggest reasons we we agreed to do it. It's uh, This car has actually never been out of Hoax Bluff, Alabama. Um, it's always been here. Um, it's the guy's, the guy that owns it now is his dad. Uh, he got it new when he was 14 years old. So um, we put that car back original. Of course, I tried to talk him into putting a, you know, a little fuel injected four cylinder in it so he could, you know, drive it a little easier. But he he was dead set on on putting it back the way it came. So <clears throat> we got that one. That that's just about finished up. And, uh, maybe we can throw a picture of it up on the uh, Facebook page. Uh, I actually have a Brook Bull. Uh, Model A Roadster in the shop right now. That's uh, it's a hot rod. Uh, we didn't build it. Um, just actually storing it for, for one of my friends right now. And then we have uh, an original. It's an original body. It's not a. It's it's a hot rod. Uh, Thirty two Roadster. That is original frame. Original Henry. It's all original Henry steel. Fenders, grill shell, uh, everything but the hood top is. Um, original henry 32 ford steel uh, so which is which is pretty pretty rare um, so that's that's what we got as far as you know model a's and uh, you know early fords in the shop right now. actually i'm a little bit surprised that you said you have a restoration in the shop that's I mean, never thought thought i'd hear that <laughs> really from you <laughs> I'll definitely have to come up that way and check it out here uh, one of these weeks. Yeah, it's it's a neat car. It's a factory and lucite blue body with black fenders and the um, oh, the gray pinstripe. I forgot the, the name of the color, but the medium gray uh, body line pinstripe. So, um, again, it's guy's color chart and woman's color chart. We have blue, gray, red, black. <laughs> we don't need the little shades. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gray. Okay, <laughs> it's just just right. But it, it 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 turned out really good. We're 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 proud that we've done it. 
you know, it's it's hoax bluff history. You know, just something neat to be involved with. Yeah. And I do have a degree in automobile restoration. <laughs> so. I think we covered a little bit of the uh, development of what put America on wheels, and we ended where we wanted to with some of Will's Will's projects and how he's, again, amazingly, I didn't think we'd end with Will talking about accurately restoring a 29 Model A, but (laughs) (laughs) accurately might be stretching it. Well, accurately for (laughs) semi-accurately. Yeah, it's it's actually on a uh, thirty one chassis, and everything's not nickel plated. There's a, there's some chrome plated mm-hmm. parts on it that are supposed to be nickel, but I mean, you know, ah, to most people, it, it's all original. unacceptable. We we we've, <laughs> we've now arrived back where I thought we'd end up. We started talking about original and Will's interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> like to thank everybody for listening and we got our uh, first patreon supporter today uh that wasn't uh sub- but anthony layton has reached out to us on patreon and he's got a sticker on the way and we'd like to thank him for being the first on the patreon page anybody else that's willing to take a look there we'll mention that the website's all new now that's all up i think all the little technical snafus that happened over the holiday weekend are there uh we've got a page also that's you know, updates the podcast and a page that kind of points your way to some of the tools we use in the shop some of the car related stuff that we can use in the home and some of the stuff we're actually using to do this podcast in case you enjoy this and you go hey i need to re- do a rebuttal to these guys and they won't answer my email so we've we've got that going and if you click through any of those links it's they're all Amazon affiliate links and of course we get a couple of bucks back that way and it doesn't cost you a dime it just keeps keeps the wheels rolling here and I'd like to thank you for listening and we'll talk to you again in a week thanks a lot if you have questions or comments email us at nodrivinggloves at gmail.com. be sure to subscribe to no driving gloves using your favorite podcast catcher Follow No Driving Gloves, one word, on Facebook or Instagram. And most of all, please check out our page on Patreon where you can help keep our tires rolling.